Welcome to Stuff You Missed in History Class, a production of iHeartRadio's How Stuff Works. Hello and welcome to the podcast. I'm Tracy V. Wilson. And I'm Holly Fry. Over the next two episodes, we're going to be talking about something that still has a lot of relevance in the world today, and that is the 1954 coup that overthrew the democratically elected president of Guatemala, which was orchestrated by the U.S. Central Intelligence Agency. It's not really accurate to say that this caused the coup, but one of its biggest advocates in the United States was United Fruit Company. Sometimes you'll see it described as like, United Fruit Company convinced the CIA to overthrow this government, and that's not exactly what happened. It also didn't happen in isolation. This was rooted in Cold War paranoia about communism, and it was also part of an overall pattern of U.S. intervention in Latin America and an overall pattern of U.S. business interests trying to influence the governments of those nations. So, today, we will have an overview of how the United States' relationship to Latin America evolved over the 19th and 20th centuries. This definitely is not every twist and turn of those decades. It's more like a through line to put this stuff in context, plus the stuff that's going to kind of come up later in the episodes. And we will talk about how United Fruit Company came to be such a major player in Guatemala in the first place and what was happening in Guatemala that caused United Fruit Company to be so opposed to it. The next time, the second part of this two-parter, we will talk about the coup itself and its aftermath. This coup was carried out in 1954, but the United States' mentality behind it goes back to the Monroe Doctrine, which was articulated by President James Monroe in his December 2nd, 1823 annual address to Congress, the speech that's known today as the State of the Union Address. And the address and the ideas in it were heavily influenced by Monroe's Secretary of State, John Quincy Adams. We talked about it just a little on our episode on John Quincy and his wife, Louisa. So there's obviously a lot more in the scope of this address, but the basic ideas of the Monroe Doctrine were these. Number one, the world had two spheres of influence. The Americas were their own sphere, and the rest of the world was another. Number two, the Americas were also not open for further colonization by European world powers. Number three, the U.S. wouldn't interfere with the internal matters of other nations. and This included remaining neutral in the face of wars in Europe and remaining neutral when it came to existing European colonies in the Americas. And then number four, if a European power attacked or attempted to exert control over a nation in the Western Hemisphere, the United States would view that as an attack on itself. One of the motivations behind the Monroe Doctrine was the recent independence of several nations in Central and South America, which had previously been Spanish colonial territory. The U.S. was concerned about the possibility of Spain or another European nation trying to recolonize. And the Latin American nations themselves had the same concerns. In 1826, Simón Bolívar convened the Panama Congress, which brought together several newly independent Latin American republics to discuss these same issues. While the Monroe Doctrine asserted that the Western Hemisphere was off-limits to European colonization, it didn't suggest that the United States should stop its Western expansion across North America— It also didn't really suggest that the United States couldn't expand its territory beyond that, which happened through everything from the annexation of Texas to the treaties that ended the Mexican-American War in 1848 and the Spanish-American War in 1898. The Monroe Doctrine also didn't really discourage the United States from trying to extend its influence within the Western Hemisphere, including through what came to be known as the Big Brother Policy. In 1889, U.S. Secretary of State James G. Blaine spearheaded the first international conference of American states. And this was the first in a series of meetings among the United States and several Latin American countries. And it was something Blaine had been advocating for about a decade. And this led to the creation of the International Union of American Republics and the International Bureau of American Republics in 1890. The Bureau later became known as the Pan American Union. These conferences and the organization that grew out of them were meant to improve cooperation among the nations involved, including working out matters of international trade, international law, and dispute resolution. 
And although it was an international organization, it was also heavily directed by the United States, circling back to that idea of the U.S. being the big brother in this part of the world. The first conference was held in Washington, D.C., where the Bureau was also headquartered. The United States also organized the Bureau and funded its first year of existence. The Secretary of State of the United States was also chair of the organization's governing board, including after Hispanic delegates tried to turn it into an elected position. The Monroe Doctrine was a cornerstone of U.S. foreign policy until 1904, when President Theodore Roosevelt articulated what came to be known as the Roosevelt Corollary in his annual message to Congress. The Roosevelt Corollary expanded the Monroe Doctrine to include the idea that the United States had a responsibility to police the Western Hemisphere, preserving the quality of life in other countries, and taking direct action to restore and maintain order. Here is a segment of that address. Quote, All that this country desires is to see the neighboring countries stable, orderly, and prosperous. Any country whose people conduct themselves well can count upon our hearty friendship. If a nation shows that it knows how to act with reasonable efficiency and decency in social and political matters, if it keeps order and pays its obligations, it need fear no interference from the United States. Chronic wrongdoing or an impotence which results in a general loosening of the ties of civilized society may, in America as elsewhere, ultimately require intervention by some civilized nation. And in the Western Hemisphere, the adherence of the United States to the Monroe Doctrine may force the United States, however reluctantly, in flagrant cases of such wrongdoing or impotence, to the exercise of an international police power. Another aspect of this that was alluded to briefly in that was the collection of debts. Under the Roosevelt Corollary, if a country in the Western Hemisphere had an unpaid debt to one of the European powers, that European power could not collect the debt directly. Instead, it was supposed to go through the United States. The United States had intervened in various nations in the Western Hemisphere before this point, including in Panama, where the U.S.-controlled Panama Canal Zone was created in February 1904. But after this shift in foreign policy, the U.S. intervened a lot, especially in the Caribbean and Central America. At various points, the U.S. occupied Cuba, Haiti, Dominican Republic, Honduras, Nicaragua, on and on. There's actually more about U.S. intervention in Haiti and the Dominican Republic and the aftermath of that intervention in our previous episode on the Mirabal sisters. Yeah, that that however reluctantly statement... It, Didn't actually play out to seem all that reluctant. It kind of seems like a cover your tail phrase, right? That's all of this. We don't want to have to do this, you guys, but according to the rules that we just made. So, although Roosevelt's address had really focused on ideas like international stability, a lot of these occupations and police actions and other interventions were motivated by protecting U.S. interests in these nations especially business interests. A lot of those businesses were major growers of crops, like coffee and fruit. And for this reason, sometimes all this U.S. military activity in Latin America during this period is looped together as the Banana Wars. It is also during this same time period that the term Banana Republic was coined by American writer William Sidney Porter, also known as O. Henry. Porter first used the term in a short story published in 1901, and it's used to describe a fictional country that was probably based on Honduras, where he was living at the time. The term conjures up images of small, impoverished countries governed by harsh and often corrupt military dictatorships and dominated by one key agricultural export, like bananas. The term Banana Republic has a lot of disparaging connotations, but it also reflects the reality of what was going on in much of Latin America. Many of these nations were reliant on one key export like bananas, with that one industry being very tightly controlled by United States businesses. And as those businesses tried to keep conditions favorable to their own interests in these countries, they contributed to ongoing instability and corruption in the nations where they were operating, makes this kind of a weird name for a clothing retailer. Yeah, I I have often over the years wondered how they landed there. Well, it kind of goes up against the Cherry Pop and Daddy song Zoot Suit Riots in terms of historical, why did you do this? Yeah, Uh, I guess it sounded good to someone at some point in time. 
But this practice of direct intervention in international affairs took a pause after Franklin Delano Roosevelt was elected president. And we're going to get to all of that after we first pause for a little sponsor break. In his March 4th, 1933 inaugural address, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt articulated what came to be known as his good neighbor policy to, quote, In the field of world policy, I would dedicate this nation to the policy of the good neighbor, the neighbor who resolutely respects himself and, because he does so, respects the rights of others. This aligned with a proclamation signed at the 7th International Conference of American States on December 26 that same year. Article 8 of this proclamation was that, quote, no state has the right to intervene in the internal or external affairs of another. So with this reduced focus on intervention, the United States started pulling troops out of the nations it was still directly occupying, including Haiti and Nicaragua. Roosevelt's administration also encouraged favorable depictions of Latin Americans and of Central and South America in the media, The career of past podcast subject Carmen Miranda was tied to this whole idea, and she became something of an international spokesperson for the ideals of the good neighbor policy. Overall, the countries in the Caribbean and Central America saw this change in attitude with both relief and suspicion after so many decades of direct military intervention by the United States. But it didn't last long. After World War II, things shifted once again, and once again, the shift was outlined in a president's annual address to Congress. This time, the president was President Harry S. Truman, and in his March 12, 1947 address before Congress, he outlined the idea that the United States would intervene to help democratic nations that were being threatened by authoritarian forces, whether those forces were coming from within or without. This Truman Doctrine grew out of events taking place in Greece, but a similar mindset was also driving U.S. foreign relations in the Americas. In the spring of 1948, the Ninth International Congress of American States was held in Bogota, Colombia. And at this conference, the Pan American Union was reorganized as the Organization of American States, or OAS. And a lot of the ideas that were part of the Monroe and Truman doctrines became part of its formal charter, basically applying these same ideas to all of the OAS member states. The charter also built on the Rio Security Pact of 1947, which was also called the Inter-American Treaty of Reciprocal Assistance, And in that, 19 countries signed an agreement that an attack on any American state would be viewed as an attack on all the signatories. This was at the start of the Cold War. And at this conference, the OAS also passed Resolution 32, known as the Preservation and Defense of Democracy in America. This resolution read in part, quote, In order to safeguard peace and maintain mutual respect among states, the present situation of the world demands that urgent measures be taken to prescribe tactics of totalitarian domination that are inconsistent with the tradition of the countries of America and prevent agents at the service of international communism or of any totalitarian doctrine from seeking to distort the true and the free will of the peoples of this continent. The republics represented at the Ninth International Conference of American States declare that by its anti-democratic nature and its interventionist tendency, the political activity of international communism or any totalitarian doctrine is incompatible with the concept of American freedom, which rests upon two undeniable postulates, the dignity of man as an individual and the sovereignty of the nation as a state. This resolution also condemned, quote, interference by any foreign power or by any political organization serving the interests of a foreign power in the public life of the nations of the American continent. It also condemned, quote, methods of every system tending to suppress political and civil rights and liberties, and in particular, the action of international communism or any totalitarian doctrine. And this is where things take something of an ironic turn. The United States approved this resolution, which condemned international communism because of, quote, its anti-democratic nature and its interventionist tendency. But not long after the resolution was passed, the United States started intervening in other nations' democracies, and not necessarily because they were under any kind of communist or totalitarian threat. 
In another shift, the U.S. increasingly handled these interventions not through direct actions, but through covert operations through the newly established Central Intelligence Agency. The first big example of this came in 1953, when the CIA orchestrated a coup that overthrew the democratically elected prime minister of Iran, Mohammad Mossadegh. The major issue was that Mossadegh had started nationalizing British oil fields in Iran, and the CIA launched the coup with the approval of the British government. So this coup wasn't really about protecting Iran's democratic election from authoritarian forces. It was about protecting oil interests for the most part. The CIA admitted its role in 2013, and of course, this is an entire other story with ramifications that are still affecting the world today, but the fact that it was successful kind of made the CIA more okay with doing more things like this in the future. The CIA-orchestrated coup in Guatemala was similar. It was ostensibly about stopping the spread of communism in Guatemala, but one of its biggest advocates was United Fruit Company, which had a monopoly on Guatemala's banana industry. So we have to backtrack for just a moment and talk about both bananas and United Fruit Company. So bananas are the most popular fruit in the United States today, with apples being a close second. Until the end of the 19th century, most Americans had never even seen one. Then in 1870, Captain Lorenzo Dow bought 160 bunches of green bananas in Jamaica for a shilling a bunch. He took them to Jersey City and sold them for $2 a bunch, which was a huge profit. He grew this into a business and, along with several other men, established Boston Fruit Company in 1886. Soon, multiple companies based in the U.S. were buying up land in the Caribbean and establishing banana plantations. And when they started running out of available land in the Caribbean, they expanded into Central America. Boston Fruit Company and other similar businesses didn't have much trouble buying the land that they wanted. Like we mentioned earlier, the countries where they were doing business tended to be small and impoverished and governed by dictatorships, so a lot of times the decision to sell this land was being made unilaterally. Often the land wasn't being used for anything else, so the governments were happy to have the money for it. Or a government might give up the land in exchange for the fruit company providing some new infrastructure, like roads or railroads or a port. And all of this ties back to the Banana Republic idea that we mentioned earlier. In 1899, Boston Fruit Company merged with railroad ventures owned by Miner C. Keith. And this newly formed company was called United Fruit Company. The combined railroad-slash-banana plantation model meant that the company could establish a monopoly on growing the fruit and on transporting it, and anything else, in the territory where it operated. And this enterprise was already pretty large, holding more than 200,000 acres of land in the Caribbean and Central America. A little over 60,000 acres of land were used as banana plantations. This finally brings us to the history of Guatemala, which we will get to after another sponsor break. Now we finally get to how all of this connects specifically to Guatemala. So as a quick overview of Guatemalan history, Spain began conquering and colonizing what's now Guatemala in the 16th century. Guatemala was a Spanish colony for more than 200 years, although in some of its more remote areas, the indigenous Maya had pretty limited contact with the Spanish. Guatemala declared its independence from Spain in 1821. From there, it was briefly part of the Mexican Empire, and in 1823, it became part of the United Provinces of Central America, which also included Costa Rica, El Salvador, Honduras, and Nicaragua. The United Provinces began to fracture in 1838 after a cholera epidemic and an uprising, and it dissolved by 1840. The uprising's leader, Rafael Carrera, became president of Guatemala and after abolishing elections, became president for life in 1854. Again, we are really just hitting highlights here for some context. For the next several decades, Guatemala was governed by a series of dictatorships which were occasionally interrupted by shorter-term governments. And the specifics of these dictatorships could really change from one administration to the next. For example, the Catholic Church was very powerful in Guatemala from 1823 until 1871. But when a more liberal administration took over in 1871, the church was stripped of a lot of that power. 
In general, though, these dictatorships were all known for human rights abuses and for maintaining control through oppressive policies and the use of a standing army and secret police force, regardless of whether you might classify them as liberal or conservative. Throughout all of this, while there were some advances in things like public health and the nation's overall economy, outside of the aristocracy, Guatemala's people lived in poverty and without a lot of basic civil rights. This was often particularly true for indigenous people and for the descendants of enslaved Africans. People of both indigenous and Spanish ancestry, known in Guatemala as Ladinos, often had more social mobility. But overall, it was socially and economically very stratified, with multi-layered hierarchy based on racial, ethnic, and class disparities. For decades, any gains in civil or human rights tended to be very small and short-lived. In these decades after becoming independent, Guatemala became a major producer of coffee, which was grown on large plantations. And as this happened, Guatemala shifted away from growing crops that were grown on smaller farms like indigo and cochineal. As part of this shift, fewer and fewer Guatemalans owned their own land as it was sold or seized to be consolidated into large coffee plantations. And this shift happened very quickly. In 1861, cochineal made up 71% of Guatemala's agricultural exports. Ten years later, coffee was at 50%, and cochineal was down to 33%. And that was a trend that continued over the next couple of decades. The country also increasingly exploited the indigenous population as a source of cheap or even unpaid labor for these growing plantations. For decades, the peasant class, which was mostly indigenous, was subject to debt peonage in which people were forced into unpaid labor in order to pay off debts. And Guatemala's economic conditions meant that in rural areas, landless people were very likely to be in debt. United Fruit Company's presence in Guatemala started to increase around the turn of the 20th century. In 1901, Guatemalan President Manuel Estrada Cabrera gave United Fruit Company a 99-year lease on land in exchange for finishing a railroad from the Guatemalan capital to the port of Puerto Barrios, which United Fruit Company also controlled. He also put United Fruit Company in charge of the country's postal service. United Fruit Company's presence continued to grow in Guatemala after 1901, with the company following a similar pattern of acquiring land for banana plantations that we talked about earlier. After dictator Jorge Ubico came to power in 1931, he granted the company another 99-year land lease. Part of this agreement included United Fruit Company agreeing not to pay workers more than 50 cents a day so that other workers wouldn't demand more money as well. Three years later, Ubico abolished Guatemala's debt peonage system, which had been keeping much of its indigenous population effectively enslaved. He was praised for abolishing that system, but in its place, he implemented a vagrancy law that required landless people to work for at least 150 days a year. He also passed a law that exempted landowners from prosecution if they hurt or killed someone while defending their property. So because this work was legally mandated and because landowners were empowered to use this kind of force under the idea of defending their property, people had virtually no negotiating power when it came to things like their pay and their working conditions. So even though this effective enslavement system didn't exist anymore, United Fruit Company still had access to very cheap labor. While Ubico was in power, Guatemala and United Fruit Company became even more interconnected. By the 1940s, 40% of the nation's arable land was being controlled by United Fruit Company. To look at it another way, less than half a percent of Guatemala's farms measured more than 1,100 acres, but plantations of that size were taking up about half of the country's farmland, and most of those plantations belonged to United Fruit Company. By this point, United Fruit Company had become Guatemala's largest employer, and it had a monopoly over Guatemala's banana trade. It also controlled the railroads, and the utilities, and the port at Puerto Barrios. United Fruit Company worked out a lot of these deals in the 1930s, thanks to John Foster Dulles, who was working at United Fruit Company's law firm, Sullivan & Cromwell. United Fruit Company was such a massive presence in Guatemala, and the United States was such a big part of United Fruit Company 
that a lot of Guatemalans thought that the two were basically the same thing. But then, on July 1st, 1944, things started to change. Jorge Ubico was forced to resign after a popular uprising and general strike that was largely led by teachers, intellectuals, workers, and students. Another general, Federico Ponce, became interim president. He promised an election to confirm his presidency, but by October of that year, it seemed pretty clear that no election was coming. Protests and demonstrations continued, and on October 20th, 1944, he was overthrown in a coup led by Major Francisco Arana and Captain Jacobo Arbenz Guzman. This was the start of what came to be known as the Guatemalan Revolution or the October Revolution. And it followed the overthrow of military dictatorships in both Ecuador and El Salvador in May of that same year. This wave of revolutions had been inspired in part by World War II and the Allies' focus on the ideals of democracy and human rights. Franklin Delano Roosevelt's Four Freedoms speech, which was his 1941 State of the Union address, was particularly influential. In that speech, he had expressed the idea that every person in the world had the right to the freedom of speech, the freedom of worship, the freedom from want, and the freedom from fear. Juan José Arevalo won the election that was held in December of 1944 with more than 85 percent of the vote. He had run on a reform platform that aligned with these ideals and with the protests and demonstrations that had led up to the October Revolution. A committee of 15 was formed to draft a new constitution, which went into effect in March of 1945. Because Guatemala had been ruled by military dictatorships for so much of its post-colonial history, this constitution limited the power of the executive branch of the Guatemalan government. It established Guatemala as a representative democracy, with the presidency limited to one six-year term, and former presidents were ineligible for re-election for the next 12 years. Military officers had to resign at least six months before election day if they wanted to run for office. The new constitution also outlawed discrimination and guaranteed, quote, life, liberty, equality, and security of the person, of honor, and of property. Juan José Arevalo was inaugurated as president of Guatemala in March of 1945, just a few days after this new constitution was signed. And he had a lot to get done in his one six-year term. The changes he and his administration tried to make were ambitious and sweeping. He was focused on addressing the issues that had led to the October Revolution and had been part of those protests and demonstrations, especially agrarian reform, improving the educational system, protecting labor rights, and reinforcing this newly established system of democracy in Guatemala. The Arevalo government disbanded the secret police and purged Jorge Ubico's former supporters from office. They changed the oath that soldiers had to take upon entering military service to include protecting the principle of democracy, not just protecting the nation. The administration allowed freedom of speech and a free press, and multiple political parties emerged. This was totally different from the previous one-party systems that tended to be under, although the Communist Party was banned. Voting rights were expanded, although women who could not read still could not vote. Other initiatives included equal pay laws and legal equality between husbands and wives. Guatemala's largest university was also put under its own control rather than being controlled by the government. Previous administrations had, for example, tried to use this government control of the university to try to keep students from learning about the pro-democracy movements that were happening elsewhere in Latin America in the 1940s. New labor laws set a 40-hour work week and established paid leave after giving birth to a child, as well as a social security system. Employers were also required to pay people in actual money rather than in scrip. In 1947, a new labor code established collective bargaining rights, including the right to strike. The new labor code also established labor courts to settle disputes, an increased minimum wage, and other worker protections. In 1948, the Arevalo government started trying to improve the condition of Guatemala's small farmers and landless citizens by passing a law that forced large landowners with uncultivated land to rent it to people who had no land of their own. The government also redistributed land that had been confiscated from Germans and Nazi sympathizers during World War II. All of this was just incredibly ambitious, and it didn't go flawlessly. 
The Arevalo administration started to struggle about halfway through his term as some of the projects bogged down in bureaucracy, and in general, it became harder to build on the earlier gains. But overall, this could not have been more different from the dictatorships that had governed Guatemala for most of its post-colonial history. However, many of Guatemala's elite were not happy about these changes, and the Arevalo administration had to fight off seemingly continual coup attempts. U.S. business interests were not happy either. United Fruit Company and U.S. officials denounced many of Arevalo's policies and programs as communism. And they started looking for a way to get rid of him, which is what we will talk about next time. Do you have some listener mail in the meantime? I do. This actually came in via some tweets from John. And John's first tweet in this uh, couple of tweets that he sent us was... Uh, Regarding our thalidomide episode, he tweeted us after part one came out and said, something I hope you discuss in episode two is how the crisis led to women being virtually excluded from decades of medical testing and all the terrible downstream effects. Shocked to discover while researching this cracked article I wrote a couple of years back and then sent us the link as well to the article on cracked. Uh, So at that point, we had... Uh, recorded and edited episode two, but it was not live yet. And we talked in that episode a little bit about how medical testing evolved and various ways that that affected drug testing and medical ethics. We didn't talk about this specific aspect of it. It's one of those things where I had things in my notes about it uh, and about especially how still today a lot of pharmaceutical testing is carried out on male test subjects and then the dosages are kind of extrapolated from that based on body weight, which doesn't account for physiological sex differences at all. Uh, But there was so much stuff to cover in that episode and not enough time to get to all of it. And that was one of the things that wound up being cut. So, yes, after the thalidomide disaster, there was also another drug that was called diethyl stilbestrol, or DES, this is a synthetic estrogen that was given during pregnancy to try to prevent miscarriages and premature labor. But not only was it not effective at preventing these things, it also caused issues for the developing fetus, including an increased risk of some cancers of the reproductive system and fertility and reproductive issues later in life, especially among women. Some of these issues can also be passed down to their children. So after these two issues, in 1977, the FDA issued a guideline called General Considerations for the Clinical Evaluation of Drugs, and it recommended excluding, quote, premenopausal females capable of becoming pregnant uh, from all phase one and early phase two clinical studies. And that guidance didn't really change until 1993. So that's uh, more than 20 years of of female patients being completely excluded from this kind of testing. And even now, uh, I mean, it's been now decades since that happened, uh, female patients are way underrepresented in drug testing, and this has enormous and far-reaching consequences on what drugs are available and which adverse reactions are caught ahead of time. It goes on and on. So uh, thank you, John, for that. We also got a couple of emails that were also about um, the the DES drug disaster, uh, which has not gotten as much attention, I think, as as thalidomide has. So, if you would like to email us, we are at historypodcast at howstuffworks.com. We're also all over social media at Missed in History. That's where you'll find our Facebook, Pinterest, Instagram, and Twitter. You can come to our website, which is mistinhistory.com, where you will find show notes for all the episodes that Holly and I have ever worked on and a searchable archive of every episode ever. And you can subscribe to our show in Apple Podcasts, the iHeartRadio app, and anywhere else you would like to get your podcasts. Stuff You Missed in History Class is a production of iHeartRadio's How Stuff Works. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows. 